was a certain priest. He had been celibate all his life and in service to the parishioners in the place where he found himself, giving dedicated, selfless service to all. But he wasn't content or happy. And he heard that in a monastery far away, there was an oracle who only answered questions with another question. But those questions were themselves answers. So he made the journey to that monastery and sitting in a small chapel, he posed his question, telling of his discontent, his absence of peace, and asking, please, what is my question? Now it was evening time and all the other inhabitants, the monks and nuns, were in their cells fast asleep. So he was left with his question and waiting, listening for the answer. And suddenly it was like a whisper in his mind. What are you leaving out? And this voice became louder and louder until it seemed to be bouncing off the walls of the chapel. What are you leaving out? What are you leaving out? And then it seemed to penetrate into the very depths of his being and became personal. What am I leaving out? Louder and louder, bouncing off the walls, resonating within him until it seemed that it was unbearable. And he jumped up and he went down the long passageways and he began bang, banged on the doors. What am I leaving out? What am I leaving out? And sleepy voices from within would say, me. The night passed like this until finally the sun began to rise outside the chapel. And so, bursting out of the confines of that little place, he looked up at this, what am I leaving out? And the sun said, me. He looked down and saw the trees and the grass waving, what am I leaving out? Me, was the reply. He fell to the earth with his head on the ground. What am I leaving out? And the earth cried back, me. As was said the other day, there are stories that come up to be told or retold that don't seem to fit the current narrative. And our current narrative is the question, where are we? What is this place where heaven and earth, or existence and non-existence, constancy and inconstancy, meet? So let's see how this already told story fits into the narrative with its symbols. It's the story of that king who had three sons 
and an only daughter, who he loved beyond measure. He indulged her every whim. She was thoroughly pampered and spoiled. But it so happened, as time passes, this princess came to an age where it was time for her to be wed. So her father, the king, and her mother, the queen, called her to them and said, we are going to gather all the eligible princes and nobles for you to choose a suitable husband. Well, the princess put on a great tantrum. I don't want to be married. My father provides me with all I need. I don't, I, I'm not going to choose anyone. I'm not going to get married. Well, this tantrum went on until finally she stomped off stamping her feet and went into her room. But as she was there, still ranting within herself, I don't want to get married. My father takes care of me with everything that I need. I'm not going to choose any husband. When suddenly the room went completely dark. And suddenly in that darkness there appeared a shining being. Now of course the princess was completely enthralled by this and then the being spoke to her, admonishing her. Of course you have to be wed. This is the way of life and the continuum of life. It is your duty to be married. And the voice and being said to her, Go to the window and look out there. Now, by this time, the king and queen had gathered all these possible suitors who were invited to the palace to a great feast, giving the princess the opportunity to choose. So when she went over to the window and looked down, there were the bevy of handsome, handsome princes and nobles. But then the being said to her, look, look in the midst of that gathering and you will see the one who it is meant for you to wed. And the being gave a name and description and there the princess saw a handsome man astride a horse, a helmet with a plume on his head. But even as the being spoke, she rejected what was being said. I don't want to get married. But that very evening, the reception was to be held and the princess was put behind a screen and the nobles and princes were paraded. And of course, when it came to the presentation of the one who had been astride his handsome horse with the helmet and plume, something within the princess rose up and before she even realized it, she said, that's him, that's the one. And the king was very pleased because this particular prince was known for his kindness, his generosity, etc., etc., and his nobility. So it was decided 
that the wedding would take place. Now, after the wedding, of course, the princess was taken back with great pomp and ceremony to the prince's own realm, where the princess was welcomed and pampered as she had been in her own palace. But her <coughs> future soon presented itself vain, demanding, petulant. And so all around her became soon tired of her childish tantrums and her childish ways. Even her husband, who loved her, came to a time where he scolded her. Don't you know that you are now a woman, a married woman, and have certain responsibilities and duties? You are no longer a child. But she continued with her petulant ways until her husband became so tired of what was happening and she shunned everyone who was around her, tired of her tantrums and her demands, so that her husband pretty much ignored her, spending a lot of time going out hunting in the forests, barely greeting her or acknowledging her. She was most unhappy. But then one day it happened once again. The room went completely dark and in that darkness appeared the being again scolding her. Your husband loves you and has been kind to you. Why are you not happy? And the princess cried. I try to love him, but I don't know how to love him. Hmm, said the being. And with that, the being took out from under its robe what we would call a wand. And with that wand, it tapped the chest <coughs> of the princess. And what could be heard was a distinct ping. Oh, said the being, now I understand your heart is made of glass. <coughs> oh, said the princess, my heart made of glass. Oh, why, why, why? And the being said, there are many reasons why a heart becomes <coughs> fragile. <coughs> and the first is one of vanity. Looking in the mirror too much, being totally absorbed in oneself. But there are other reasons also. The princess said, what can I do? What can I do? I don't want to have a heart made of glass. And the being said, you must do exactly what I tell you from this moment on. Shed your gowns of silk and satin. Be rid of all the jewels, trappings and adornments that you have. Become 
like a servant to your servants. And most of all, be silent. Become mute. The being disappeared, leaving the princess with a resolve to do exactly what had been instructed of her. She shed her silks and satins. She began to listen instead of demand. She gave away all her jewelry and adornments and she did not speak. Now everyone in the palace thought that she'd lost her senses. But her husband indeed loved her and he decided on hearing that there was a physician in a far distant land that could address problems of this nature. He decided that he would make the journey to try to find a way to heal his wife. Now his family wanted to send her away, send her back from when she came. But the prince insisted and he readied himself for the journey. Now of course the princess knew of his intention and as he was astride his horse ready to embark on that journey, the princess went to the balcony of her chamber and looked down in that moment something happened within her she felt a cracking sound she dashed out of the chamber down the stairs and out into the courtyard where the prince was astride his horse she went over to him and she grabbed his leg and both of them together heard the clear sound as though a crystal glass was shattering. The princess looked up at <coughs> her husband and said, D -d 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 Don't go! I, 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 I love you. Prince jumped down from his horse and gathered his wife up into his arms and carried her back into the palace. She told him her story. And of course we know the end of the story. What's the end of the story? Happily ever after. Okay. Three sons. <laughs> <laughs> and three sons. <laughs> so if we look at the symbols contained in this story and the previous story, because we can ask us what am I leaving out? How many people do you meet and they're covering themselves up? Arms over their heart. Protecting. Keeping in place their seated there. Yeah. Ivory Tower. Have you watched your gestures? Have you recognized any signs that are there 
when life approaches you, that you What is this place where heaven and earth, existence, life, and non-existence meet? Have you heard the little cracking sounds yet? indicate the shattering. 